Good morning. We are back in Hebrews chapter 5 this morning. And uh, we're going to be going over verses 11 through 14. If you'll open your Bibles to that section. And I'll begin. Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So I'm going to read now a few more passages that I found that are sort of related to the text at hand. In John 16, 12, Christ said to his disciples, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 and 2, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. 1 Peter 2 Verses 1 through 4, Peter says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. So, last week, if you'll remember, we were talking about the Melchizedekian priesthood and who Melchizedek was. We said that that was Christ, and we gave reasons as to why we believe that was Christ. And we spoke about Christ's priesthood, and the author here is bringing us to a point in his letter where he addresses the church, and he says, we have a lot that we'd like to say about this priesthood, about this Melchizedekian priesthood of Christ and how Christ has come to be your high priest, but it's hard to explain this to you. And then he gives explanation why it's hard to explain, and it's because he says they have become dull of hearing you have come to you have uh, uh, come to need milk instead of solid food he tells them that by this time they ought to be teachers so so that's the first thing we're going to look at why does he tell them they ought to be teachers does he mean that everybody in the congregation should be an elder no, I don't think that's what he means. But he tells them that by this time in their Christian life, since the moment that they've been converted to the gospel of Christ until now, they should have reached a point to where they're able to teach others. I think is what he's saying. You ought to be teachers. You ought to be able to teach others. I think that if we look at the gifts, and this is sort of like a sermon to itself, but if if we look at what the purpose of the gifts that are given to the church are for, if you'll turn to Ephesians 4 and verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, 
for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about excuse me, with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So we're not going to stay in this passage for long. I just want to draw a few points out here. Christ ascended on high and he descended and he gave gifts to men, to his body. And the apostle here speaks of what some of these gifts are. And we know that there's no gift that is given that is not for the edification of the whole body of Christ, of the whole church. Um, the whole body helps itself out and it helps itself out to grow up into the one who is the head and that is Christ. And so we see here the concept, sort of the concept that we have in Hebrews 5, that when you're in Christ, you start out as a child, as a babe. We know that's so because when you come to Christ or when you are converted to Christ, what has to happen to you is that you have to be born again. And so if you're born again, the initial part of becoming a Christian, that means you're a child, you're a babe in Christ. And um, here he speaks of no longer being children. But what I want to get at here in this text is that some of the gifts that Christ gave to the church is that they would be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So these are the gifts. Notice the one we want to point at to get back to our text in Hebrews is teaching. Teaching is a gift. But what is this gift of teaching given, given for? Is the gift of teaching just given to the teachers so that they can teach the body and then no one else is to be teaching? I don't think that's what it's saying. Now, teachers can teach, and they, they have been given this gift while others um, have not been given this gift. But I don't think that that restricts others from teaching. I think that's why he is exhorting uh, the church in Hebrews that you should be teachers by now. Because if you'll look in verse 12 of Ephesians 4, it says why the gifts are given. It says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. What ministry? It's saying for the, the equipping of the body, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of a ministry. And I believe that ministry is each ministry of each gift. He gave somebody to be apostles. The word apostle means sent out one. That They are sent out. And so to some extent, um, Believers participate in that work of taking the gospel to the nations. We know in the book of Third John, one way that believers participate in that work is they, that they give aid uh, to those who are sent out for the sake of the name. Um, and so believers are to be participating in that ministry. The, and the apostles are given that gift so that they might teach others how that they are to Go out for the sake of the name. Uh, and some prophets, the same function, some evangelists, they teach the church how to evangelize. The whole church should be evangelizing, telling forth the gospel of Christ to other people. And those who are given the gift of evangelism or, or to be an evangelist, they are given that gift so that they might equip the saints for the work of that ministry. So that they might be teaching the saints how to evangelize. And some pastors, pastors, what is a pastor? The word pastor, it means to shepherd, to take care of. We think of the idea of looking out for the sheep. And so pastors are to be teaching the flock 
not only are pastors to be shepherding the flock, but they're to be teaching the flock how to shepherd each other, how to take care of each other. And the same applies for teachers. They're to be teaching the flock how to teach each other. They're to be teaching the flock what they're to be teaching each other. And so all of these gifts that Christ gave to his body are for the equipping of the body for the work of that particular ministry. And I believe that's why the author of Hebrews says that by this time, you should be teachers. He's not saying everybody should be an elder teaching, but you, he's saying by this time you should be teaching each other. You should be helping each other. But you, but you have come to need milk and not solid food. And if you look back at Ephesians 4, the purpose of all of this, Paul says in Ephesians 4, is that, um, that we should no longer be children Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. So these gifts are given for the purpose of spiritual growth. For the purpose of bringing the body as the church in growth into maturity, into maturity in Christ. And I, and I think it's something that the author later on, I believe it's in chapter 12 of Hebrews, he has to rebuke or to exhort the church not to forsake the gathering together of one another. Because that's where these gifts are exercised is when we gather with, with each other. In Christ. And so that's why he says, I believe, this time you, you ought to be teachers. Because they're, the, maybe some of them were forsaking the assembly. They weren't gathering together and therefore the gifts weren't, weren't being exercised. Therefore they weren't growing. And he says, you have come to need milk again and not solid food. And that's why these things that we would like to tell you, like to explain more of, that we have much to say about, it's hard to explain because you have become dull of hearing and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Now, what does this concept of milk mean? Because this is a concept that we are rebuked uh, by others for teaching that um, meat is milk. You know, we believe that the gospel of Christ is his work on the cross to actually save his elect people. We believe that election is milk. We believe that grace, true grace, is milk. The fact that Jesus Christ was sent into this world to actually save a particular people that the Father had given him. We believe that's milk. That's not meat. meat. That's what we start out on in the Christian life. And we refuse to extend fellowship to those who don't believe that, to those who don't believe that gospel. What, what many have come to call Arminians, those who exalt their free will, those who believe that Christ came to just make salvation available and then the condition of salvation, instead of being the work of Christ on the cross, the condition of salvation becomes your faith or your choice or your belief or, or whatever that particular person who believes that Jesus died for everybody to make salvation a possibility might condition salvation on. That is a false gospel. And people who call themselves Calvinists, who say that they get their doctrine from Dort or John Calvin or the Reformation, they extend fellowship to Arminians. But they say they would actually differ from Arminians, and at least some of them, and they would say that Christ died for the elect. Now, we know that they deny this as well through the words that they use to, to talk about the death of Christ, saying that the atonement is sufficient for everyone. 
and that when the gospel is preached that God genuinely desires to save everyone, including the reprobate. But they say that Arminianism is milk. They say that everybody starts off in Christianity as an Arminian. And they say that that is milk. Is that milk? No, because it is a lie. It is not of the truth. Milk. What is milk? What is the comparison here? What is the analogy that he's making? Milk is something that actually causes you to grow. It's actually nutritious drink. A lie does not produce growth. Thinking that you're saved because you met the condition of your choice and therefore your neighbor who heard the same message as you didn't choose to believe, that gives you a ground to boast before your neighbor. Because if you're making the difference in between heaven and hell by your choice, then you were smarter than him or you were more noble than he was or whatever have you. It can't be the grace of God because they say that that salvation is freely available to everyone to make the right choice and be saved. Therefore, the difference maker has to be you. And when the difference maker becomes you, that is a grounds to boast. And if it is a grounds to boast, it is not grace and it is not true God-given faith. It is a self-righteous gospel. And a self-righteous gospel is no gospel at all. It is a false gospel. And it, instead of milk, it is actually poison. Because it will, God will not use that message to cause his people to be born again. 1 Peter 1, 23 through 25 says that you are born again through the living and enduring word of God. It says all flesh is like grass and all grass like the flower of the field it fades away. It says, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And it says, that, and this is the word that was preached to you, the gospel. And so what does God use to regenerate his people? What does he accompany? He accompanies the preaching of the gospel. When the gospel is preached, he gives his people life to believe that gospel. He causes them to be born again. It's not that the message gives life. It's God gives life. And when God gives life, that life that he has given is, is that he is giving his people faith to believe the truth, which is the milk. Because when you're born again, you're a babe in Christ. And so God doesn't regenerate his people and give them poison to drink. God doesn't regenerate his people and cause them to be nourished by a lie. In fact, that very passage in 1 Peter 1.23 says that you are born again, not by corruptible seed, but by incorruptible seed. So right there, it makes the contrast that you're not born again through the lie. You're not born again through a lie. You're born again through the truth. And so when the author of Hebrews says that you have come to need milk, what he is saying is, is that you have come to need the gospel again. You have come to need, you need to go back to the foundation. You need to go back to the foundation. And we know that one of the reasons maybe why that was so is because we've addressed that the author is here. He's confronting people who might have been struggling with apostasy. Some might have apostatized and left the faith, and we know if they left the faith, they were never of us. If indeed they had made a true profession in the true gospel, and they had heard the gospel of right. <clears throat> but the fact that some of them maybe had considered going back into the temple, they need, they need to go back to the gospel and be founded in that. They need to go back from to the rock from which they were hewn. 
No, I'm not saying that believers believe a false gospel or believers depart the faith. That is never so. But when a false gospel comes, we do know from Galatians that it might cause that believer to be troubled. But though he is troubled, he will never depart that which God has grounded him in, that which God has rooted him in. We have the author here in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 5, he exhorts his readers in the church that they have come to need milk and not solid food. Now let's look at uh, some of the passages that we read about milk. Let's look at the one in Peter, 1 Peter 2, 1 through 4. It says, therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Coming to him as, a lit, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God, and precious. So he is, Peter here exhorts those that he is writing to, to lay aside these sinful practices, and as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that they might grow. Desire that gospel. And then here he gives us a little bit about what that milk entails. He says, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. The gospel has to do with God's grace. And we know that grace has to do with election. We know that grace has to do with God actually loving a people from eternity past and, and sending his son into the world to die for them and to redeem them. We know that what grace means is favor. And the only way that we will have the favor of God is if Christ has earned it for us. And that's what the gospel is about. It's about Christ's life and death. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ taking flesh to himself and becoming priest for his people after the order of Melchizedek, living a righteous life in accordance with the law of God, perfectly obeying his father and being pleasing to the father's sight, and then bearing the sin of his people in his body, having the sins of the elect imputed to him, and then being treated how his people should be treated in hell on the cross, the wrath of God being poured out upon him. And yet Jesus Christ, by the power of his indestructible life, satisfying that wrath for his people and proving that it's satisfied by raising from the dead three days later. And then ascending from the to the Father 40 days after that and sitting down at the right side of majesty on high where he forever sits until all his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. So that is the milk. It's all about his work, that he was given a people that God had loved, and that, that people is, does not include everyone. And he came into this world and he saved them. He stood as their substitute. He lived the life that they could never live, not even one second, not even after we're Christians. We can't merit the favor of God. We don't merit the favor of God. Yes, God does not leave us to ourselves. He doesn't leave us in total depravity. He works in us to will and to do to his good pleasure. But none of those works merit his favor. They are merely a benefit that we reap because Christ died for us. And he won't leave his people continually hating him and hating each other. He died that he might send the Spirit into our lives that he would finish the work that he started. And so this gospel, this milk, is in accordance with God's grace, Peter says. Now, there's a verse we can turn to that uh, equates grace with election, that equates grace with everything we just talked about. There's many verses. One of them that's very clear <clears throat> is in Romans 11. It says uh, in verse 5, 
Even so then at this present time there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace it is no longer on of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, a work is no longer a work. So grace and works are opposite. And in verse 5, he, he, he places grace and election together. That there's come to be a remnant, a people, in accordance with the election of grace. It has to be of grace. Because we can't earn it ourselves. And because it's of grace, it has to be in accordance with God's choice. And as we've talked about many Sundays, God's choice you know, is not really meant to indicate to us that there was a particular point in time when God sat down before the creation of the world and he said, well, I would like this one and I would like that one. And he picked people out. We know from Jeremiah 31.3, that it says that God says to Jeremiah, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. And so because God's love is eternal, that means God has always loved his people. And conversely, he has always hated another people. That's why he says in Matthew 7, 23, depart from me. I never knew you, which means I never, never look at the word, the word never. It was never there that God knew them. God never loved them. Conversely, he has always knew his people. He's always loved his people. And that's the basis he tells them to part. He's never loved them. And so the, when we think of election, when we think of grace, we think about of God's love that he has for his people. If you're saved, it's, the only reason you're saved is because God loved you. From before the world was. And he sent his son to die for you. If indeed you have tasted that he is gracious. That's what it means. Have you tasted the milk? This is the milk. You're not growing if you haven't tasted the milk. You're dead. You're dead. Death doesn't produce growth. Death produces decay and rot. When we're born again, we come and we begin to be nourished by true food and true drink. By the milk, which is the gospel of Christ. First Peter 5.12, Peter writes, By, by uh, Sylvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you brief, briefly, Exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God which you stand. Why did Peter have to say that? This is the true grace of God which you stand. Because there, there, there's people who redefine grace. We know that that's so today. There's many pe ways that people redefine grace. Grace is unmerited, unconditional, unearned, undeserved, at least by our nature, favor. Now, why do I say that? It's, well, because there's a sense in which we deserve God's favor. And that, and that sense is only the fact that Christ has imputed to us. God has imputed to us Christ's righteousness. Christ's righteousness deserves nothing but God's favor. His life deserved nothing but God's favor. And that, that's the gloriousness of the gospel that when God imputes to us Christ's righteousness. He treats us how he should treat his son. And we have the favor of God. That's the only reason we deserve it. Because we've been credited a righteousness that we could never produce. That's the true grace of God. We didn't bring it to ourselves. We weren't righteous enough to bring it to ourselves. That's why that whole gospel, that whole way that people redefine grace and they say that salvation is available to everybody if you will if you will make the choice for Jesus. That's why it's bad news, because we're depraved. We don't have any righteousness in ourselves. And if that's how it was, no one would ever be saved. Because no one would ever make that good choice for Jesus. Because man by nature is evil. He has no righteousness. That's why we need Christ's righteousness. If you had righteousness in yourself, 
You wouldn't need a savior. And that's what these people who distort the grace of God and who don't teach the true grace of God, but teach a lie. That's why they stand condemned by God. Because their faith, their confidence is in their righteousness instead of the righteousness of Christ. <clears throat> no. We're going to look at the last section of this. We've talked about what milk is. We've talked about what milk is not. And then the fact that now we're going to talk about a little bit of the, the aspect of the fact that he's saying you need to go back to milk. You know, I, I've got a lot to tell you about this priesthood, but it's hard to explain it to you because you've grown dull of hearing. And so he's not saying he, he's not going to explain it to them. He's not saying that he can't explain it to them, but he's saying it's hard to explain because you need milk and not solid food. He says, for everyone partaking of milk is without experience in the word of righteousness. For he is an infant. We know as we come to Christ, we grow in that milk. We grow in that gospel. We begin to put off our former manner of life. We, we, we begin, we're being conformed unto that gospel and what that gospel teaches us. And we grow. And because of that, we are able to partake of more meatier things within the word of God. And it says in verse 14, but solid food is for those full grown, having exercised the faculties through habit for distinction of both good and bad. That was the Lit V in the NKJV. It says, but solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So they've exercised the faculties through habit or because of practice, they have their senses trained to discern good and evil. That practice is within the word of God. You, you are reading the word of God. You are learning the word of God. You're teaching each other within the body. You're exercising your spiritual gifts. And just like anything else, when you practice it, you get better at it. You get more fine-tuned to it. You become more skilled at it. Certain things leave you. And you partake of other things. Let's think about a, a baby, a baby who drinks milk. He, he's drinking milk. He's drinking milk. He's drinking milk. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's growing. He's growing. He's growing. His body's growing. His body's maturing. He starts to cut teeth. Then he, he goes on what? Baby food, which is mush. Then pretty soon he's partaking of solid food because he's continually growing from this food from this nourishment certain things are leaving him he's getting bigger he's getting new things he's growing hair he's growing muscles he's getting stronger and therefore he's able to to digest solid food and so in the spiritual sense of this when christians grow through the milk and then they begin to cut teeth and they begin to digest more meatier food because of this practice of partaking in the word of God. They have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Discernment is judgment. The word of God is our basis of judgment. Now, what do we judge? What do we discern? We discern that which is good and evil which consists of both the doctrine and practice. We're able to discern of 
practices, whether they are good or evil, we are able to discern better of doctrine, whether it is good or evil. Going back to Ephesians chapter 4, Paul said, From whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. I didn't go back far enough. Um, verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of, fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Why? Because as the gifts are being exercised in the congregation, as the word is being taught, as people are growing up into the fullness of Christ, through pra practice of these things, they're able to discern good and evil. And so when a doctrine comes along, a strange teaching comes along, they're able to, to point it out, to pinpoint it. No, that's wrong. That's false. That's not of Christ. That's not true milk. That's not the true grace of God. And this is why. This is why. That's why this is not the truth. And it's of the lie. Or a certain practice comes along. Hey, you know, we, we can do this in Christ. We're free to do whatever no that's not of that's not of christ you know we have a lot of that today people want to use christian so-called christian liberty as liberty to sin and then when you rebuke them for it they they call you a legalist and say you're rebuking for me for something that i'm free to do or they want to go to certain passages and say that disguise um adultery as their right to divorce and remarriage because somebody has offended them through whatever excuse they they're given to uh to remarry and commit adultery and then they cloak that as righteousness they cloak it as righteousness you know, we we grow up into him that we might have our senses trained to discern good and evil through practice through repetition Philippians 1 9 through 11 Paul said and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment that you may approve the things that are excellent that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So Paul's prayer for the church in Philippi was that their love would abound more, more and more in knowledge, in all discernment. Now, where does that knowledge come from? The Word of God. We're all going, we're, Continue to go back to the Word of God, and it's the Word of God in truth. We define things properly. We know we've heard the truth. We're not coming to the Word of God with biases. We're not coming to the Word of God, um, and then and then we read something and we say, "Well, if that's true, that means my whole situation has to change." Or if that's true, that means I have to do this, this, and this, and I really don't want to do this. So I need to go to scripture to distort it, to give myself justification for, for the practice that I'm currently in or for the doctrine that I currently believe. No, we go to the word of God with an unbiased mind. We read what it says. We interpret it in its context and we let God be true and all men be liars. And then we conform our lives unto what it says. We conform our lives unto what it teaches. It doesn't matter what situation it puts us in. It doesn't ma matter if it causes us to have, have to endure things we don't want to endure. 
like certain people say, just getting back to the topic of uh, remarriage. They say, well, I'm already remarried. What if you were a homosexual? A homosexual marriage. Our society condones homosexual marriage today. What, what if you heard the gospel and God gave you faith? Are you going to stay in that marriage? Or are you going to leave it? That is an immoral marriage. It's not true marriage in God's sight. And the same applies with adulterous remarriage. Jesus said that the one who puts his wife away or his spouse away and then marries another, commits adultery. Jesus called that marriage adultery. That marriage is adulterous. It is not a true marriage. Adulterous marriage is not true marriage, just like homosexual marriage is not true marriage. God doesn't join two and make them one who are homosexuals. Neither does he join two and make them one who are in the act of committing adultery. That's what Jesus said that it was. And so when you find yourself remarried, you need to leave that relationship because God calls it adultery. Or we come to a certain doctrine and we see that it, even what we believe essentially, we, it's placed us in a predicament that our flesh does not like. We don't know of many people that we regard to be Christians. And sometimes I know that we can become depressed because we don't have that many people that we can speak to. But that doesn't mean that we're going to change our doctrine so that we can have people to associate with or to fellowship with because we don't have fellowship with them because we don't believe their gospel and it doesn't matter if it makes us uncomfortable in our flesh if it makes us lonely because we, we regard God to be true and we know what God's word teaches Certain food that brings great nourishment to our bodies does not taste good <laughs> to our flesh. But nevertheless, it produces growth. Certain things don't smell good that are actually very good for you. And so there's certain things in the Word of God that our flesh may not like but through practice through practice through repetition we mortify the deeds of the flesh we put them off just like when you eat certain food that you may not like i used to not like onions i used to not like certain vegetables now i enjoy them <laughs> And so it's the same, you know, the, the physical always pictures the spiritual through practice. Through practice, our senses become trained to discern good and evil. Good and evil. And that's what we want to draw out from today. We're to be nourished upon the word of God, the true food of God were to be continually practicing these things, setting them before ourselves, exercising the gifts that God has given us in the church for the edification of each other, stirring one another up to good works, encouraging one another as the day draws near, looking forward for Christ's return, if you've been given the gift of teaching, teaching others how to teach, teaching others what to teach, the gift of evangelism, teaching others how to evangelize, teaching others the message of evangelize, that we all know how to communicate that message, how to 
speak about that message with others, how to proclaim it, what the scripture says about evangelism, going to all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. Or the gift of um, an apostle, if you feel like you've been called to go out and to proclaim the gospel to another country. I'm not speaking of apostleship in terms of the apostles of that day. We know that that has ceased, but there are people who are still called to go to other countries and to be sent out from the church or to aid those who are sent out, etc. Or prophecy. You know, not, not speaking necessarily of forth telling the future, but of prophetic, prophetically telling forth the word of God. And we can all prophesy to one another in that sense, because the word of God is right here. here. We forth tell it all the time. What it says, thus saith the Lord. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the true food that you have given us. We pray, Lord, that we would be as Job and that we would desire your word above our necessary food. We pray that we would partake of your um, flesh and that we would uh, partake of your blood by faith. Lord, even as we celebrate, as we have the Lord's table today, we pray that it would be a commun communing with your body and with your flesh. We pray that it would be a great encouragement in grace to us and that we would remember you and that we would proclaim your death until you come. Father, we pray that you would save those who are yours we pray that you would give them the faith to believe your gospel of what you have done. And we pray that you would um, grant repentance of dead works, that you would grant repentance of unrighteousness. We pray and we thank you for the encouragement that is in your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.